Uh, hello and welcome to the Vermont New Farmer Project webinar, Selling to Regional Markets. I'm Jesse Schmidt. I work for the UVM Extension New Farmer Project and uh, with us today is Maggie Donnan. She coordinates the Beginning Farmer Program with the Intervale Center and she uh, organized this webinar for us today. Uh, welcome Maggie. Thanks Jesse. Um, so I just wanted to briefly introduce the webinar that we're going to be um, presenting here today. So um, it's going to be, uh, as you can see here, about selling to regional markets, um, how Vermont farmers sell directly out of state. Um, so we're really excited to have Diane um, Amanda here with us today to talk about their farms and how they um, sell to markets outside of Vermont. Um, and yeah, I think this, is, this will just be a really good opportunity for people to learn about um, this model. And so I just wanted to quickly introduce um, the Vermont New Farmer Project, which uh, is sort of bringing you this webinar today. Um, so the Intervale Center is one of the partners in the Vermont New Farmer Project. Um, some of the other partners are uh, UVM Extension, not um, the Rutland Area Farm and Food Link, which is down in um, the Rutland region. Vital Communities in White River Junction. Um, and so we are uh, a, a group of service providers um, throughout the state focusing on supporting beginning farmers. Um, and here's just a brief list of some of the opportunities that we um, offer to beginning farmers. So um, webinars like this one and like many others that you can find on the, um, the URL page, um, workshops, in-person workshops. Um, different tool sheds with PDFs of useful resources and information about everything from business planning to production planning to marketing and um, rules and regulations. Um, there's a blog. Um, we offer one-on-one -on -one business planning um, and also coaching uh, with beginning farmers. And then we also have an online coach. So you can go on to the um, that New Farmer Project website and um, walk through a series of questions with the online coach um, about uh, you know, different um, questions about your farm business and then some suggestions of resources and next steps that you might want to take that um, could be useful. So um, our first presenter today is going to be um, Diane St. Clair from Animal Farm um, in Orwell. And so Diane, I'm going to hand, um, hand the mic over to you um, and just to, just briefly, um, we're going to try to do questions at the end. So if you have any questions um, and you don't want to forget them, feel free to type them in the chat box um, on the lower left hand um, of your screen. And um, then at the end, we'll just scroll back through those and um, point them in the direction of the presenter that uh, they um, are geared towards. So Diane, if you just want to hit your talk button up there again. Yep, I got it on. Great, all right, and I'm going to mute Hi. myself. Okay, hi, thanks for inviting me today. Um, this is a great topic for all farmers, I'm beginning farmers especially. So my name is Diane St. Clair. I have some slides here of my farm, but and I'm going to scroll through them. They're not particularly tied to any one topic I'm going to talk about, but will give you a feeling for my farm. So I've owned Animal Farm, which is in Orwell, Vermont, for 15 years. I make butter and buttermilk. Um, and I have a small licensed creamery. I sell my butter directly to restaurants and I use a distributor for my buttermilk. I'm going to kind of give you a bit of background about myself and because I think that it will help explain some of the decisions that I ended up making. Um, there are kind of three themes that I think inform my history to getting where I am and one is just a love of farm and animals, another is a, a real passion about food and cooking and another is um, an interest in marketing. So I grew up in Baltimore, Vermont, I mean Baltimore, sorry, Maryland. Um, I, my family has no agricultural experience, um, so that is not part of my family experience. Um, but I've always been drawn to animals in the outdoors, so as a kid I rode horses, um, I worked on a dairy farm for summers when I was 13, uh, 14 and 15, and I found that I really liked farm life, I liked the hard work that was involved and the long days and the physical labor of it. 
so it, that those experiences that those summers really uh, made kind of an imprint on me as I moved forward. But then I went to college, and I when I finished, I worked in Washington D.C. and then I moved to New York in the mid '80s, and um, I started. I got my master's in public health, and I started working for the New York City Department of Health in maternal and child health. And I was working there just as the AIDS epidemic broke out. It was a, a pretty intense time. Um, a lot of the work that we did in that department was on lowering infant mortality and trying to get especially low-income women into prenatal care. So in doing that, there was that was my first experience with marketing. You may not we think about marketing as like just selling goods, but really it's also selling services. And you know we set up hotlines for women to use, and we did a lot of marketing in subways. So I got familiar with writing press releases and talking to reporters and things like that. At the same time, this other strand in my life, which involves food and cooking. Um, so there is a very famous restaurant, which maybe some of you know, Chez Penis, which is in Berkeley, California, and the chef Alice Waters, I think she was just at the Intervale, but she had opened that in the 70s in California, and it really emphasized farm-to-table relationships and connecting with uh, farmers, restaurants connecting with farmers, and making that connection uh, to diners around fine dining, the importance of good ingredients, and this trend, which started in California, was starting to move to New York. And there were more and more farmers markets in New York City. And I was interested in food and chefs and what farmers were doing there. And you know, had an opportunity, because I lived in New York, to eat at a lot of great restaurants that were starting to make inroads around this trend. And I started sort of religiously reading the New York Times dining section and magazines like Gourmet, which really covered a lot of these beginning trends in food. And even then, the emphasis was really on organic, local, wasn't as big as it is now, but was the trend was moving from organic towards the local theme. So then in uh, the late 80s, I, I moved to Burlington, Vermont, and I, I, I started doing similar things. I worked in the Vermont Department of Health and had kind of a similar job, um, a lot of doing a lot of public health information around women's health and children's health. And then um, in, around 1990, I had my second child, and I stopped working full time for the health department and decided to pursue my farming goals, uh, but I lived in Burlington. So what I did was I got a team of draft horses, and I started doing logging with them, and I also forged a relationship with the Intervale Community Farm, which at that time was probably the largest CSA um, in Vermont. And we started doing most of the tillage at the farm with my horses. Um, and it, it really pulled people into the farm and got them excited, the, the members, about coming down to the farm and seeing the horses and having animals down there. But then in 1999, I found my farm in Orwell, which you can see on the screen here. Um, it's not a very big farm. It's 35 acres. Uh, but I decided I wanted to get one cow. I got a family cow. And of course, she gave way too much milk for our family. So I had been noticing that there were a lot of farmstead cheese makers around. Um, there are even more now. But then there was, were quite a few. But no one was making dairy products like butter. So um, I then found out that if I wanted to make butter and sell it legally, I had to have a licensed creamery. At that time, there were no, there wasn't small equipment around. The smallest pasteurizer I could get was 50 gallons, which was certainly not going to work with one or two cows. So I found someone who was willing to fabricate a small pasteurizer for me. And while he was doing that, and I was kind of working my way through the regulatory process, um, I decided that I had to figure out how to make butter. My goal was to try to make butter the way it was made 
uh, 100 years ago, sort of pre-factory farm dairy products. Um, but I wanted it to have all the benefits of modern technology, meaning I could keep my milk uh, cool and keep the quality high. So what I did was I bought a lot of out-of-print books um, that were written um, around the late, you know, 1890, something like that, before um, butter started being made in, cr in big creameries. And it explained to me a lot the techniques of making butter as well as, you know, the strange kind of flavors you can get in things when it's not done properly. Um, and I knew that I wanted to stay a small farm. I knew I didn't want to get big. Um, I, I don't use a lot of mechanization on my farm. I, I use a bucket milker. But for instance, I don't have a cream separator. Even now I have 11 cows. I hand separate all my cream. So getting big was not an option for me. And so I knew that if I was going to make this viable, I was going to have to sell to a fairly high-end market. And at that time, there really weren't that many high-end restaurants in Vermont. You know, people go out to eat in Vermont. They're, they're not spending $300 to have a meal generally. So oddly enough, I had just finished reading a book called The Soul of the Chef, which was written by Michael Ruhlman. And it was about, a lot of it was about the chef Thomas Keller, who had just opened a restaurant in California called the French Laundry. And it described his passions about cooking, and again, very similar to Alice Waters, a real passion about sourcing the most excellent ingredients he could find. And so I thought, you know, and, and also Ruth Rachel, who was the dining critic for the New York Times had called the French Laundry the most exciting restaurant in the United States um, in the late 90s. So I thought, well, you know, there aren't any farmstead butter makers that I know about. I had finally gotten my butter to the point that I thought it was marketable. And so I said, well, the, here's a person, Thomas Keller, that I would trust to to taste my butter, so I'm going to send him some. So I sat down and I hand wrote him a note. I said, I'm a small farmer in Vermont. I have two cows. I'm trying to make this farmstead product. Uh, there's really nobody else that I can think to send this to. Would you just try my butter? And he emailed me back and said, yeah, sure. Just put it in a box and send it FedEx to the restaurant, and I'll let you know what I think. Now. I mean, you couldn't do this now because he's not in the kitchen anymore, but this is before he became a super chef. So um, I sent my butter, and two days later, he called me back and said, you know, left a message on my machine basically saying, you know, this is the best butter I've ever tasted. Who are you? Where are you? What are you doing? How much can you send me? Which, you know, completely blew me away. But... Uh, I, you know, I stuck my neck out and it paid off. <laughs> so um, I had two cows then and I started sending him about, I don't know, 15 pounds a week. And then pretty soon he asked me to, you know, send him more butter so I got another two cows. And then he opened a restaurant in New York called Per Se and asked me if I would get two more cows, which I agreed to do. And um, along the way, because of his reputation, people started calling, other restaurants started calling me for butter. Um, so basically the way that my, my system with the restaurants work is that I am seasonal. So I make butter uh, basically from August, September when my cows calf, I try to breed them all more or less at the same time, until June. And then I dry them off, and the, the restaurants don't have butter for those two months. But um, the benefits of that for me are, you know, is that I don't, because I'm the only one working on the farm, I wouldn't get a break in, unless I did that. So that's why I do that. Um, but the nice thing is that the restaurants make a commitment to buy a certain amount of butter that they say they need 
every week for the whole season because you know butter is a fragile product unlike cheese I can't just let it sit in the cave if I don't sell it so I have enough cows to meet the demands of the restaurant and every week I just send them what they need um, obviously it's not always that way they take a vacation every now and then and and I've d developed other um, other ways to sell it but most of the butter goes out every week the same amount to the restaurants for those 10 months so I sell 95 percent of the butter I make to these restaurants I sell about 100 pounds a week um, the rest of I do save some of it to go to the Middlebury co-op because I want people in Vermont to be able to get some of it and um, then along with this butter I've always had buttermilk because the buttermilk is what's left in the turn but it wasn't until four years ago that I was actually able to bottle and sell my buttermilk and that's because um, you need a bottling machine to do that and there were no bottling machines that were small enough for my creamery until recently again um, technology drives a lot of what people are able to do around you know highly regulated industries like dairy but so um, the buttermilk is a little trickier to sell directly because it's heavy and weighs a lot to ship um, I do sell some of it directly to the restaurants that I sell butter to but I make about 200 or 220 quarts a week so I use Provisions International to sell my buttermilk and they distribute it throughout New England to restaurants to co-ops to health food stores they sell it uh, in Boston and it also goes to New York that way which is really a great distribution mechanism um, I chose them because they sell a lot of artisanal cheese um, and they're very passionate about using artisanal producers I met with them I you know I called them and asked them if they would take my product and we got together and they tried the buttermilk first the thing that makes my buttermilk really unique is that it's really out of the churn versus almost a hundred percent of the other buttermilk in the stores is just low fat or skim milk that's been cultured so they understood that difference and we're happy to bring me on board the picture on your screen to the right is the buttermilk you sort of get a sense of how thick it is um, so uh, I think that there are, are really you know great opportunities um, for people making food in Vermont because Vermont has such an excellent reputation for natural quality products um, consumers think of Vermont as for better or worse full of small farms um, whose farmers have stories and are very passionate about what they do I mean it seems like uh, the alcohol industry here beer cider wine is really taking off um, the other thing is I, I think there's real opportunities for people who might be interested in dairy but don't want to make their own value-added product to partner with people who want to do that um, I see I'm getting a lot of phone calls and requests to come to my farm from people who live in the Hudson Valley of New York or live in New York City and they need high quality milk they want to make cheese they want to make butter they want to make all this kind of stuff but they don't want to be farmers um, I think the challenge would be how to get them your milk but I, I definitely see potential there um, my advice to people who are interested um, ab ab about moving ahead is especially about food is to you have to know about the food industry in order to sell food I really think you need to know about trends about what's emerging about who's in the vanguard who's doing what what chefs are emerging and passionate and what their interests are and how this is reflected in their restaurants um, I think you have to have a good product that's really important but it's also important to have an idea about where it's going to go um, 
I would urge people to reach out to chefs and restaurants to taste your product and get feedback and involve them in the whole process. I, I wouldn't start with something that you don't think is a good product, but I would try to engage them in the process of what you're doing. I'd also think about how your sales model works for you. For instance, for me, farmers markets weren't really an option because I'm the only person working on the farm. So, you know, I couldn't do the milking and processing and also sit, you know, at the farmers market for a whole day. So it, you have to look at what's going to work for you. Um, I think that many people consider marketing challenging, um, but if you don't do it, your product isn't going to sell. <laughs> and if you use other people to do the marketing for you, you're going to pay more for it. Um, I think distributors can be really great getting your product around, but um, you, even with a distributor, you still have to do the marketing. With provisions, they sell hundreds of things, so it's still really important for me to do the marketing. One thing I discovered when I started selling my buttermilk is that um, it's sort of fallen out of favor because it hasn't tasted very good in the last 30 years and a lot of people don't know what to do with it. So I wrote a buttermilk cookbook and by writing that cookbook I've gotten a lot of publicity um, about my buttermilk and my farm and it, it's reinforced you know, my products. So um, the other thing about marketing is I, I wouldn't consider it, I mean a lot of people think that you're bothering people when you try to get them to buy your product. I think you should look at your product, you know, as an opportunity for chefs and restaurants. They're looking um, for the, for stories about the farms they're using and um, the ingredients that they're using. So. Um, it's their opportunity to know you and tell your story to their diners. Um, finally, I would just quote Bella Abzug, who was a very well-known New York City feminist and representative to Congress in the 70s, and her message to people, especially women, was put yourself forward. And, you know, that's really what you have to do. You're the one who best, you know, understands your product and the story of your farm. So you have to go out there and tell the world about it. That's all I have to say. All right, well, thanks, Diane. That was really great. Um, and yeah, there's just a few more photos here. Um, is that your churner there on the left? I think that might, that's my churn. And I, our barn was originally a horse barn, but we took the stalls out and put those comfort stalls in and you can see my bucket milker there. Great, cool. Well, um, again, if people have questions, feel free to type them right there into the chat box. Um, so especially things about, um, you know, specific sort of distribution considerations. Um, I might ask you a few of those um, at the end. Uh, mm -hmm. But right now I'm going to hand it over to Amanda. She's right here next to me. Um, so Diane, if you just want to hit that talk button again and just mute your mic, um, and we'll move the slides forward. Um, all right, here's Amanda. Hi, um, glad to see some folks here. My name is Amanda Andrews, and I am the co-owner of Tamarack Hollow Farm and we are currently located in Burlington, Vermont, uh, kind of north of the Intervale Center, which most people know about. Uh, that's me and my husband on the bridge leading to our farm there. We, um, we raise, our farm is about, eight, it's about 12 acres of certified organic vegetables. We also do pasture-raised pork. We do about 50 to 60 a year of them. I have a small herd of Belted Galloway beef, about 12, and we process about four a year. We have 500 laying hens, and we do like 150 to 200 turkeys a year. And we sell 80% of our gross sales are through Union Square's Green Market, which I'll be primarily talking about. We also do the Farmers Market on Saturdays and have a very small CSA in each one of those locations to sort of round out cash flow. Uh, we have about 40 members total, so 
we keep it really small and it just kind of gives that boost, you know, in um, February, March when there's not a lot else to get income out of. Um, so just to give you a little overboard, uh, overview of the sales kind of landscape down in New York City, the, these are kind of the primary direct market locations that are available. There's the New Amsterdam market and Chelsea market, which are both permanent uh, indoor market locations where vendors are tend to be more larger established businesses, but there's also kind of uh, pantry type stores where people sell uh, value added products. And then down to earth bar farmers markets were previously called community markets and green markets are what we would call your your regular farmers market here. And then there's a new, kind of one of the new upstarts that's gotten a lot of attention recently is Smorgasburg. Uh, another Vermont farmer is bringing product down there that's been in the news a lot. It's more of a outdoor food, foodie market. Uh, there's some value added. There's a lot of prepared foods. There's not many farms. It's not farm focused. It's, it's food focused. Uh, but a lot of what farmers are doing now is food focused rather than farm focused. So I threw that in there too. Um, so we do green market and that's a map of where the farms that do green market come from. You can see us all the way up there on the northernmost border of their <laughs> line and then the guys that are right outside of the, the line of where the farms are pulled from is uh, Deep Mountain Maple and Glover and then um, Consider Bardwell Cheeses are we're the three farms that come from Vermont to New York. So we got hooked up with green markets in 2005. My husband started doing them. He had been raising pigs, certified organic uh, eggs and chickens for eggs and chickens for meat and then lamb, all organic, selling to co-ops, Burlington Farmers Market, driving all across the state, doing deliveries to retailers and restaurants and still not making enough money for the farm to be profitable. He was working a day job, um, teaching and was kind of at the point where he was going to stop farming or change something to have <laughs> the farm make money. And at a social event met someone who had a family member that worked for Green Markets, heard about it, heard they were looking for that product. So he started selling in the summer of 2005, um, was invited to do two markets on the Upper West Side, which if you're familiar with New York is a very um, wealthy area, but not uh, necessarily known for its food scene. So he did about four weeks of markets there, having you know, grew up on the top of a mountain in Vermont, had never been in New York City before this, like terrified out of his mind at the age of 25 going down um, and starting it and did it for like a month and wasn't making enough money and so told Green Markets, you know, he wasn't going to be able to do it and they kind of bent and were like, okay, well try this other market that we have. Um, and see if it works and moved him to Union Square, which is the flagship market there. Within a month, he made enough money for the farm to be profitable for the year um, in month of October. And then November, he made, his, made profit, quit his job. Um, so that's back in 2005. I started Green Markets in 2007 working for an organic vegetable farmer in Orange County, New York. and went on to work for a cheesemaker and baker and then a miller baker, also selling through Green Markets and met Mike through Green Markets at that time. So I moved up here in 2010. Um, I originally planted two acres that first year, planted six acres in 2011, planted 10 acres in 2012, and we now do 12 acres of certified organic vegetables, 80% sold through Green Market. Um, green Market landscape, it's operate 54 farmers markets in New York City, Manhattan and all the boroughs. They are strictly producer only and which means it's a lot of huge conventional farms in the Hudson Valley that have been around for you know 50 years that made that transition from kind of old school farmers markets that you think about like that haven't changed since the Middle Ages, kind of survived through the change of farming in the 40s and the 50s and then started coming down to farmers markets when they got started in New York City in the 70s. Um, so they kind of survived that transition period, went to being big commodity vegetable producers um, and then they just kind of are big vegetable producers but they sell it all through a direct market. So you have farmers that are coming down with 
10 or 12 different vegetables in huge amounts. Like these walls of vegetables will be twice that size most of the day. It's, it's, that's kind of the backbone of it. And then there's um, small organic farms that are more like what we're familiar with in Vermont. There's fishermen, bakers, and some value-added producers, but there's no middlemen, no co-vegetable brokers. It all has to be producer only. Um, less than 10% of green market farmers are certified organic, and that does not line up with the demand for what the customers want. So there, there is a need for more of what we're used to in Vermont, you know, small family farms producing an organic product. Um, and 57% of green market farmers plan to retire by the year 2030. So these kind of big conventional farms, like the picture that's up on the screen, are kind of phasing out and moving more towards what you know the food scene here in Vermont is like. Um, so what's one of the big challenges for us selling in New York City, just in terms of product, is we're marketing to a region that's 300 miles to the south of us. It's, you know, many growing seasons change for us from there to here. So we, there's people that have tomatoes down at market right now, and we won't have tomatoes until August. So what do you, when you're selling, this, and this, I'm trying to speak basically to what Diane was saying, what, you have to figure out what you do, do it well, and then sell the hell out of it. People, you know, when I talk to people about what makes Vermont brassica is so great. Like, I like this picture because they, I have cabbage and kale up front, and then you see there's like some tomatoes in the background somewhere. And you know, people think of tomatoes as like the sexy crop, but for us, we have a really loyal following on our brassicas because they taste good in the spring. You know, we can grow them; they taste good. We can grow them straight through the summer. They might not be at their height, but it's cool enough in Vermont that we can. And then. We get our first frost way ahead of anyone else. The brassicas come into their own. We have huge, beautiful, super flavorful brassicas during our six-month-long fall season we have up in Vermont. And people eat it up. You know, there's, when you're competing against a New Jersey farm, we're never going to have tomatoes and sweet corn ahead of them. But we can grow crops they can't dream of growing. Um, so we really try to push what we do well. and. People love it when we can explain the biology of the plants and all of them. That kind of stuff that makes us love growing what we grow. Uh, I'm trying to remember what picture is next. So yeah, so green markets are year round. Oh, perfect. Green markets are year round, which also presents some challenges. You know, you think that picture in the right, those huge crowds, that's great. But that picture on the, the picture on the huge crowds that are great, but the um, picture on the right, you can do just as well on that day when all the market diehards are out, as you can in the summer when it's all tourists. Um, it's really building those relationships with your customers about what distinguishes your product, rather than being one of the uh, big, giant, conventional, wholesale-style farms that happen to be wholesaling their vegetables through a direct market. Um, some of the other costs associated with market attendance, it's a huge time suck. We harvest and wash all day, Monday and Tuesday. We leave Tuesday night. We need to be off the farm by 1 a.m., you know, Tuesday night, Wednesday morning, drive down. The market goes all day on Wednesday. Uh, we have to be set up and ready to sell by 7 a.m., and we usually are there until 6.30 p.m. Um, and then you're wiped out all day Thursday, and I'm still kind of out of it right now because I did market this week. <laughs> um, our truck, we have a 16-foot It's a 25,999 gross vehicle weight truck, which is right below um, the what you require to have a DOT license. So that was a very deliberate choice. Um, it gets 18, 19 miles, 18 miles per gallon. Our fuel is about $250 round trip. Our rental spot for each day is 12 foot wide, and then your depth varies depending on where in the market you are. So it's $80 a day for a 12 foot spot. We go up to a 20 foot spot in the summer. So you know it's it's minimal compared to what you're being exposed to, but it, it adds up. Uh, you have to think about tolls, driving down, what route you're going to take, and it's an outdoor market. So how do you keep your veggies looking fresh all day in the summer? You're out there on pavement for 12 hours. And how do you keep them from freezing in the winter? We actually build, build a four-walled tent. You can kind of see some of them there in the picture on the right, and run propane heaters and generators in there to keep stuff fresh. But 
you'll sell everything you bring down and you'll sell it for a good price. Um, so we deal with state regulations about crossing state lines, so we have to deal with the DOT, we have to deal with USDA regulations, all of our meat must be USDA slaughtered and, and certified rather than using state facilities, so that has some challenges. Um, there's a lot fewer facilities in Vermont that uh, are USDA certified, so there's some restrictions there. And then all of those things listed add up to a lot of burnout. Uh, to make this market work, you really me or my husband have to be there. Like Diane was saying, we really have a personal relationship with the, the chefs and the customers that we sell to, and it's part of the value of what they're getting from our product. When my husband or I are not there, we send a worker, or we have people that work for us in the city if they're there. Um, the sales suffer. People really recognize our faces and want to talk to us, and that relationship is a big part of our, of our business plan to think about if you're ready to commit to doing a direct market in New York, it will, you'll be rewarded for doing it if you do it well, but it does take a lot more than, than I can really quantify. Um, so why do we do it with all of those costs? Um, it's a huge market. Union Square has 60,000 people go through it on a daily basis, and that is, so if we have 600,000 people here in, in the estimate from Sterling of Heifers is that 10% of them list uh, organic local produce as a high priority uh, part of their diet. So that's the equivalent to the number of people that pass through Green Market um, each day. It's, you know, you have them all right there, captive audience. And chefs and market foragers, which is again going right into what Diane was talking about, the Wednesday Union Square particularly um, there's markets there Monday, Wednesday, Friday, Saturday, and Wednesday is specifically kind of known as Chef's Day. Saturday is too hectic, um, and Monday and Friday are kind of smaller markets. So that's the um, truck for Blue Hill, which is a uh, Michelin star restaurant um, in New York City that buys a lot from us. And they fill that truck up sometimes twice a day, and that's all directly purchased at retail price from farmers at the farms. Um, and that's one of 20 restaurants that I could rattle off that come through market religiously first thing in the morning, and they'll come up to your stand and say, oh, you have purple broccoli today. You know, how much of it do you have? And they'll say, oh, I have 20 cases. They'll say, oh, I want all of it. And you say, I can't sell you all of it. I can sell you 10 cases this week. And they're like, oh, okay. You know, it's amazing to have the tables kind of turned that way where the negotiations are they really want your product. They know who we are. They really want our product. They're not just looking for the cheapest. Um, and you can make those negotiations. And um, those sorts of chef, the chef buyers and the market foragers are the core relationships that we have down there. You know, you can go down knowing that X foragers are going to buy Y amount of product. And then anything you sell over that is, you know, just a bonus. Um, we have very loyal customers down there. And social media is really important. You know, if you go back, to this picture, is yes, that's on read on Union Square's Instagram or re-Instagrammed, you know Union Square's social media. Um, they have like 19,000 followers, and if I'm going to be bringing down a new product, I take a picture of it, put it up on Twitter, put it up on Instagram, say you know, heirloom tomatoes are coming in tomorrow, and they retweet it, and it goes out to 19,000 New Yorkers. It's great, you know, <laughs> you're kind of doing the work of marketing before you get there, and the, then people know to come to you first when you're in this big of a market. Um, so social media is really important for us. Um, and then some products we do, like I said, like some products we do get a higher price on than here, but most of the time it's not the price differential that we get in New York, it's the volume differential. A good market in Burlington on Saturday, we might sell 30 bunches of kale, but a good market in New York on Wednesday will sell 300 bunches of kale, and it's the same price point, it's just that volume that makes it work. Um, and that's you know one one product, and that's paying for all of our costs for the day, and then it's all the bonus. Um, on our meat and eggs, the proteins are about a 20% markup from Burlington, which is great um, to be able to get that. And again, volume 
volume helps. And then for the products, the vegetable products, we really can get a price markup on kind of the old familiars that people really want. And it's not really what you think it is. Like tomatoes, we sell at the same price as we do in Burlington. It's the kind of traditional veggies, broccoli, cauliflower, beans, carrots, red cabbage, are some of our most profitable vegetables. Like celeriac is one of our most profitable vegetables. And it's, they have the people that have farmers markets as a daily part of their routine and are eating local organic food are willing to pay to get those products locally and organic because when they go to Whole Foods, they're all from California or Peru. You know, to get organic local broccoli is kind of difficult. Like, go to the grocery store and try to find it. And so people are willing to pay for that. Um, so that's, that's what we do. It's kind of quirky. It's not work for everyone. And I wouldn't recommend any um, new or beginning farmer to just like apply to green markets and start it. It's totally crazy. Um, but there's a lot of other, the, successes, the success of green markets has spawned a lot of other relationships that are a lot easier to get started in if you're not ready to commit to doing a direct market, market down there. Um, the first one I'm going to talk about is called Quincible because we do a lot of work with them. Um, it's kind of what we're trying to transition to. Quincible was started by a woman that used to be a market forager. Uh, so a market forager, I should explain that, is, um, sorry, I just realized I haven't explained that. It is uh, someone that works for a restaurant, and their sole job is to be the kind of go-between between the chef and the farmer's market. So they build relationships with all the farmers at the farmer's markets. She knows what my crop plan is. We meet every winter and go over my crop plan. And knows who's going to have what at what time, what products they do the best, what products you know, they might have at a different time of year than other farms. And bring that information to the restaurant. Figure out what the restaurant's menus for you know, the different seasons are going to be. And then they come to the farmer's market and pick stuff up from us. So it's some things are a wholesale price break, some things aren't. Um, but it's really that, that relationship that they are coming directly to you and picking up the product at the farmer's market rather than me having to make 10 restaurant deliveries. Um, and it's a lot easier. The chefs come through, but they don't come through as often. They might come through once each season as the season changes. And you know, if we have something super special we want them to try, we do communicate with them and say, you know, we're, develop, we're growing this new variety of whatever we want you to try. I gave it to your market forager. Make sure you get it. You know, send them that email or give them that call. But um, to have that go-between, that weekly interaction is really great. So we can email the forager, tell them what we have coming in. They'll come by market, pick it up, tell us what they want the next week. Uh, they can taste something right there and say, you know, give us immediate feedback. Um, so Quintable was started by a market forager. She started her own business and she has a, a weekly box of produce and value-added products that are all locally sourced. And then she also does products that aren't available locally. She buys from small family farms. So for, for example, um, she buys citrus from small farms in Florida, California, olive oil from small family orchards in Italy. And it's like she invented the best job in the world for herself and just gets to travel the world and taste amazing food and source things responsibly. Um, so people subscribe to her in what you'd think of as a CSA, and they get a box each week. And she commits to buying certain things, like she gets all of our cabbages from us in the fall. And, and then she, but she also comes to the market every week. And if we have something different, you know, she, she'll try it and tell us if she wants it in the future. Or if she needs to sub in, like she got her chart from someone else, and they were 50 bunches short, she'll pick up um, extra things. And uh, she is a great growing business that I would pay attention to. Um, she grew up in New Hampshire. She loves Vermont and New Hampshire. She comes up here all the time to look for new products. And I would be happy to um, pass along any products to her. Um, Good Eggs is an online farmer's market. They started in San Francisco. And they now have farmer's markets in Brooklyn, New Orleans, Chicago, and San Francisco, I believe. Um, very similar to um, myfarmstand.com, I think, is what we have up here. 
So you sell something basically using their platform. You can list each one of your products. You put a, a rough estimate of how it's packaged, you know, rough weight for an individual product or a half pound bag of whatever greens. You set your price. Um, you then people order for a pickup later in the week. Um, then uh, you know the marketplace closes at a certain time and switches to a new product, and then you get your order of you sold 20 half pound bags of spinach. You pack up your 20 half pound bags of spinach and you deliver it to the Good Eggs warehouse, and then they cut you a check for 75% of the price that you have listed. So you can see some of the products here. Um, so five, what's it say, three dollars a bag for a quarter pound bag of spinach. Um, so she set that price, that, that farmer set that price of $3, and knowing that she was going to get 75% of whatever was listed. So it's a more traditional wholesale relationship, except you're setting the price um, rather than the um, wholesaler telling you what the price is. But again, this is you are driving down to New York and delivering the, the and just like with principal, you're, you know, you're bringing the product to them. There's, sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw in one more thing that's not on here, there's an, another business that's kind of closing that gap between these like online retailers and online market aggregation services that are delivering in New York. Annie Myers, who is operating out of Craftsbury, um, Myers Produce, is delivering delivering from Vermont to New York City twice a week, I believe. Um, if you look at Myers Produce, that's she has a website, and she's looking for you know organic Vermont products. People that know how to wholesale have you know done that relationship before, uh, producing things in large quantities, high quality, and she's buying from Vermont farmers and driving down to New York and selling two Good Eggs and two Quincible, and also just to individual restaurants. Um, she was also a market forager that started a business. And these people really, you know, they know what quality is, they know what they're looking for, and they know um, the restaurants that are going to buy it. They, they have those relationships. You can kind of lean on them to get started, to kind of get a feel for um, what the landscape is like down in New York City. Um, yeah. yeah. Is that good? Um, okay, thanks so much, Amanda. That was amazing. That was so much good information. Um, so I just want to uh, open the floor up to some questions. I see we have a couple in here that I think um, w could apply to both of you. Um, maybe Diane, and if you first want to just um, sort of, if you can talk, speak a little bit to how you find um, restaurants to contact. You spoke in your presentation about the initial um, Chef and you know reading about him in Roman's book, but um, as you try to expand into new um, restaurants, as you grew your herd and had more butter, um, how how did you find um, restaurants to contact, and and how do you find um, I don't know if your buttermilk ends up in restaurants or if provisions mostly distributes it to retailers, but um, if you're also um, finding new new chefs uh, to buy that. Yeah, um, I think it's back to my um, original point, which is um, to really try to start digging into the food world, and specifically if you're interested in restaurants, in the restaurant world. I mean, every Wednesday, the New York Times has a dining section, and you know you can you can see that online, and it talks about new restaurants that are opening. Um, it talks about um, up and coming chefs. It talks about um, what you know. It does restaurant reviews, so you have a sense of how what what the restaurants like. Um, it'll talk about James Beard Foundation award winners, which is sort of like the Oscars of food, and you can see you know which restaurants are getting awarded and which chefs are getting awarded. And um, as you start, as names start to come, you know, now you can find information out online and you, you can start to see those restaurants that care the most about, um, you know, quality and working with farmers. I mean, like Blue Hill, like Amanda was talking about, um, Thomas Keller, David Chang, there's, there's a lot of restaurants that are, 
are sort of prominent in that area. And if you just, I think you just have to sort of go off the diving board and just start reading. It's not like you can just get a list of restaurants. You kind of have to get a sense of them and, you know, which are going to appeal to you and then, you know, reach out to them. That's probably the hardest part. But um, I, I think it's sort of just about starting to immerse yourself in, in food culture and um, just learning about the industry. And yeah, Diane, would you mind just speaking to, you know, even the specifics of how you make that contact. So you read about a new chef who you think might be a good option, um, you know, in a New York Times magazine or something. And do you, I think that's something that, you know, at least farmers I work with, you know, they're like, do I call? Do I, if I'm down there, do I show up? Do, you know, not wanting to be too pushy, but also wanting to, you know, all, like sell themselves like you were talking to. Um, you know, is there a time of day, a method that works best for you? I, I think if you can go online and get um, an email of the restaurant that, I mean, I wrote a letter, which in this day and age is pretty weird, so maybe people pay more attention to letters, I don't know. Um, I, I would, you know, try to email or send a letter. I, I think calling a busy restaurant can really be hard, so I would try to do it in writing first. I mean, if you're if you're in, I mean, most people aren't in New York, so that's not going to be, you know, as convenient. I guess I would, I would try to do it through email or, or writing and then maybe follow up with a phone call or if, um, you know, or if you have a contact somehow. Um, I mean, I've made contacts for people, you know, with, with the French Laundry and per se if I can or with Barbara Lynch if I you know if I think it's going to work and they don't have a purveyor in that area but um, and then when you get one restaurant <laughs> that's of note it's not that easy to get the others because then you can ask the chef you know do you, I need to sell more of this broccoli or I need to sell more of this butter do you have a suggestion for who else might be interested in it and they'll give you three or four chefs names that they know and then you use that as the entering point I think getting the first one is the big challenge all right great that's really useful and here I'm gonna pass it over to Amanda to address those things Hi, this is Amanda again. Um, yeah, how how you find who to sell to? Um, like Diane said, like these chefs are looking for good products. They have a lot of the restaurants that value um, farm to table. Like I said, they have buyers. They have market foragers. Um, email the restaurant again. Yeah, calling a restaurant is never great. Um, if you email a restaurant, ask to for a contact for the buyer. That's their job is to be the middleman between the chef and the and the vendors and give them your product, tell them, you know, ask them if you can stop by with a sample. And again, it's hard, you know, it's New York, but if you can line up 15 restaurants, make a trip down, drop off your product, you know, on a, come down on a Tuesday afternoon or a Monday afternoon, set up a time, um, sit down with them, tell them your farm story, give them your product make sure they taste it, you know, that, that this is their careers are built out of, out of being the buyer that finds that product, um, that builds those relationships. And like Diane said, once you get one restaurant or one relationship with one buyer, the New York is huge, but the food scene is really tight. And if you start to understand the food scene, it, it will open to you. You know, if you're passionate about what you're doing, you have a story about why you do what you do, um, it's not as intimidating as it sounds. Um, and I, I can't stress enough that Diane's really on it. You need to, you need to know, you know, you don't have to eat at these restaurants. They're expensive, but you need to know who they are. You need to know who their chefs are, who their sous chef is. It's not that hard to find out, you know, get a subscription to Gourmet and understand what the food trends are and who, who the chefs are, who the sous chefs are, who the buyers are. It's a small community and they go back and forth and if you can um, build a relationship with one or two of them, you, your product will, will find, a, find its footing. Great. Thanks.
thanks to both of you guys. Um, I think there's just one more question here from Jesse um, that I think is probably uh, um, more for Diane. But um, Diane, would you mind just speaking to how you assure quality when you're shipping your butter? It sounds like the buttermilk all goes through the distributor, so they take care of that. But um, when you're sending that directly down. Yeah, I've I've just good old FedEx. I I use FedEx and I use cold boxes and gel packs, and I actually send my buttermilk to California that way too. Um, it, it, I mean, you know, I'm not selling ice sending ice cream. Uh, it's not something that's you know got that kind of melting point. Um, if you have a good cold box and um, you have gel packs, even two day, well, it will be fine. OK, great. Um, so I don't think there's any other questions. Um, Jesse just put up the link to the SurveyMonkey um, survey about this webinar. So if everyone um, would be kind enough to just quickly fill that out, it shouldn't be too long. It helps us a lot with understanding um, you know, how to present this information most effectively. and what information um, might be useful to present on in the future. Um, and then here up on the screen now is my contact information. Um, so you know, I work with farmers really in a wide range of um, topic areas. And we have a great network of consultants and technical assistance advisors um, at the Intervale. So you know, if you really have any question under the sun, or if you're um, a service provider and you're on the webinar and you have a farmer who need some support um, with business planning or some coaching, um, definitely have them um, shoot me an email or give me a call. Um, we have you know, continued funding for the rest of the year to be able to support beginning farmers in a variety of ways. Um, so I just love to be able to meet and connect with people and um, hear what they have to um, ask about and how we can support them. Um, and if you have any ideas about you know, great webinar topics or workshop topics, um, spinning off of this or um, related to another topic, you know, definitely just let us know. Um, we love to love to hear from people. So um, Jesse, do you have anything else to add? Or are we good to? Excellent presentation. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. And um, Maggie, thanks for organizing this. And Amanda and Dan, thanks for sharing all of this uh, information and all of your knowledge and expertise. It's been uh, really great. Um, so thanks, everyone, and, and have a good rest of your day. Thanks. thanks a lot. Bye. Bye.